Hello, this is Father John again, Father John Brown from Holy Transfiguration Greek Orthodox Church in Marietta, Georgia. And we are continuing in this, our fourth class in the series called Introduction to Orthodoxy. We're at this phase of the uh, series of classes. We are looking at the history of the early church and how it relates directly to orthodoxy and forms our faith and practice. So let's get started. In the previous class where we ended, we talked about the persecution of the Christian church, which began almost immediately at its inception and continued for over 250 years. So now we begin looking at the events leading up to and the results of the momentous reign of the Emperor Constantine and beginning with his role in the age of deliverance, the deliverance of the church from Roman persecution. The next major event of the early church was the conversion of Constantine to Christianity and his rise to the imperial throne. Flavius Valerius Constantinus, which is rendered into English Constantine, was born in 272 AD. His father shared the office of emperor with three other rulers. He became a general in the Roman army. While he was serving in Roman Britain, his father died in Rome and Constantine marched toward Rome to claim his father's title. Outside Rome, Constantine prepared for a battle against his rival for that office named Maxentius. The early church historian Eusebius recorded, about the time of the midday sun, when the day was just turning, he, referring to Constantine, said he saw with his own eyes up in the sky and resting over the sun, a cross-shaped trophy formed from light and a text attached to it, which said, by this sign, conquer. Amazement at the spectacle seized both him and the whole company of soldiers, which was then accompanying him on a campaign he was conducting somewhere and witnessed the miracle. <clears throat> he was, he said, wondering to himself what the manifestation might mean. Then while he meditated and thought long and hard, night overtook him. Thereupon, as he slept, the Christ of God appeared to him with the sign which had appeared in the sky and urged him to make himself a copy of the sign which had appeared in the sky and to use this as a protection against the attacks of the enemy. This is again from uh, the historical writings of the early church historian Eusebius. Constantine obeyed the vision. He ordered his army to paint crosses and letters. He wrote, or in English today we would pronounce it Cairo, the first two Greek letters in the word Christ on their shields. He won the battle at the Milvian Bridge and entered Rome and became the sole emperor of the Roman Empire. He also began his transformation into a Christian. The 31-year rule of Constantine was to have a profound effect on Christianity. Early in his reign, he issued the Edict of Milan, which legalized Christianity throughout the Roman Empire. For the first time in its history, Christianity was freed from persecution. At the same time, at the meaning this Edict of Milan, uh, Emperor Constantine declared himself a Christian. One of the effects of Constantine's reign is that of monasticism. Monasticism is the practice of people, both men and women, who voluntarily withdraw from normal society renounce the pursuit of wealth and family in order to both devote their lives to rigorous prayer, fasting, and simple labor. Their goal is to acquire closeness to God without the distractions of normal life. Male monastics are called monks and female monastics are called nuns. Monastics usually form groups called monasteries. Other monast monastics are solitary. Their, life, their lifestyle of all monastics their lifestyle of self-denial is also called asceticism, which comes from the Greek word ascesis, which means training. This is the same word used to describe the discipline of athletes who train for competition in hopes of reward or winning the prize or winning a trophy or winning recognition. Monasticism is recorded in the Old Testament. The book of Numbers prescribes in an order called the Nazarites. Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when either a man or a woman consecrates an offering to take the vow of a Nazarite to separate himself to the Lord, he shall separate himself from wine and similar drink. He shall drink neither vinegar made from wine nor vinegar made from, made from similar drink. Neither shall he drink any grape juice 
nor any eat, nor eat fresh grapes or raisins. All the days of his separation, he shall eat nothing that is produced by the grapevine from seed to skin. All the days of the vow of his separation, no razor shall come upon his head until the days are fulfilled for which he separated himself to the Lord. He shall be called holy. Then he shall let the locks of the hair of his head grow. All the days that he separates himself to the Lord, he shall not go near a dead body. He shall not make himself unclean, even for his father or his mother, for his brother or his sister. When they die, because his separation to God is on his head, all the days of his separation, he shall be holy to the Lord. This concept of separating oneself and not partaking of earthly pleasures and being totally devoted to pursuit of God by prayer, fasting, and being in the wilderness and separation from society, this pattern of monasticism is continued in the New Testament. Monasticism can be seen in the New Testament, especially in John the Baptist. We see in the descriptions in the Gospels of this beginning at a very early age. Luke writes in chapter 1, verse 80 of his Gospel. So the child grew and became strong in spirit and was in the deserts till the day of his manifestation to Israel. Matthew writes in his Gospel, chapter 3, verse 4. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and his food was locusts and wild honey. So you see this radical uh, transformation or voluntary embracing of extreme simplicity and, and uh, reducing their diet to barely a subsistence level, but yet devoting themselves completely to the pursuit of relationship with God. Now, and archaeologists have discovered a Jewish monastic group that lived near the Dead Sea in the first century AD called the Essenes. John the Baptist may have been one of them. Like most monastics, they lived in seclusion, tight community, and asceticism. They made and preserved many, many copies of the Hebrew Bible and other sacred texts. It is from, this, from the Essenes that the Dead Sea Scrolls discovered in the 20th century have come. If we have the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's because the Essenes made the copies and, and preserved them, and they were discovered uh, fairly recently. Christian mon monasticism was practiced even before Constantine during the centuries of persecution. During the Roman persecutions, when word spread of approaching danger, many Christians who lived ordinary lives in cities and villages fled to the wilderness to escape arrest. They expected their isolation to be temporary, and they planned to return when the danger subsided. But in their new situation of isolation, prayer undistracted by urban entertainments, and simple work to meet their physical needs, they discovered a closeness to God that had, they had never known before. And when the danger of arrest had passed, and it was safe to return to their former lives, they chose to stay in the wilderness and continue in their newfound lifestyle. St. Anthony the Great, and you see his dates there, which are before most of, much of his life was before Constantine, so that he lived most of his life, not all of it, but most of his life during this period of persecution. St. Anthony the Great is considered the father of Christian monasticism, who spread the practice throughout his native Egypt. After Constantine became emperor and the threat of persecution was gone completely, monasticism continued to thrive in Christian areas as people sought the peace of the desert. As the Roman Empire became Christianized, many at the time felt that something valuable had been lost. The threat of persecution meant that most Christians were extremely dedicated to their faith. But with the perse persecution gone, some Christians questioned the sincerity of those who were entering to the church at no risk. Worse, some Christians felt that some people were embracing the emperor's religion in order to advance their careers, particularly those engaged in politics. And so even though I'm sure if we were to take a poll in that era of Christians, they would were extremely grateful and thankful to the fact that they no longer had to, had to live and worship in fear and uh, they would not have to see their friends 
tortured and put to death as a public spectacle anymore. But yet this, the, some people really felt something had been missing. The, 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 if to put it in the modern terms that the new post legalized, legalized church, there too many people have been, were becoming soft from the position of some people. Finally, with the legalization of Christianity, martyrdom quickly went from being common to extremely rare. And some Christians who aspired to become martyrs no longer had that option. But in monasticism, they could find a new form of martyrdom. They could live out the words of the apostle Paul. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Instead of being put to death for their faith in a Roman prison or arena, zealous Christians could offer that still offer their lives to God as a sacrifice to Christ through the rigors of asceticism in a monastery. And so this was sort of a paradigm shift for the what monasticism was all about. And it, monasticism has ever been ever since been a major influential force within the Orthodox Church and it has an enormous amount of prestige and respect to those who pursue this, this voluntary lifestyle. Now, another major event that took place as the result of Constantine, and that was the founding of New Rome, Constantinople, as it was called, and it's uh, still called in some circles. Another major, major decision by Constantine was to build a new capital of the Roman Empire for Rome, Rome to a new location in the eastern part of the empire. This location was a small town called Byzantium, from which later the term Eastern, the, the term uh, Eastern Christianity in the capital became called by some of the Byzantine uh, church or the Byzantine East. And that name comes from the very small town over which the new major city was built, uh, begun by Constantine. Constantine called his new capital city of the East, New Rome. Subsequently, it was referred to by people as the city of Constantine, and it was named Constantinople. And you can see there, if you know Greek, you can see how Constantinu Polis in, in, in Greek. So as you can see on the map there to the right, basically where the East and the Western halves of the post of, of Constantine's, after the Constantine's division, of the empire between east and west. The west continued to be ruled in Rome. The east would now be ruled from the new capital called Constantinople. And if you if you like maps and you can learn from them, uh, that's what those are the areas we're talking about. So when I'm talking about the Christian east versus the Latin west, those are the areas we're talking about. Another important aspect of Constantine and his rule was the age of the ecumenical councils. Not only did Constantine legalize Christianity, but he also used the resources of the Roman government to assist it. He paid for the construction of countless churches, contributed to the charitable works of the church, and paid stipends to the clergy. Another pivotal act of Constantine was his sponsorship of the first ecumenical council of the church, the, nice, the Council of Nicaea in the year 325. Now the word ecumenical comes from the Greek word ikumeni, which means the inhabited earth. As the first Christian emperor of Rome, he felt that his duty to provide for the gathering of all the bishops from over all over the world to strengthen, strengthen the household of the church. Synods and councils had been, held there, had been held before, but these were all local and sometimes regional and were held usually in secret because Christianity was illegal. But now, under, under Constantine, bishops from as far away as Rome and Britain and Germany and Spain and Africa and Asia Minor, which is today would be the area of modern Turkey, and even as far away as the Sassanid Kingdom, which was, would be in modern day Iran, could now travel at the emperor's expense and all gather under one roof. The first of these ecumenical councils was held in Nicaea near Constantinople in 325 AD. And there a map can kind of show you where Nicaea was. If you find Constantinople, you can see in that general area, 
the where Nicaea was. The city that's there today that replaces it is Iznik in, in Turkey. So that's where this took place. Now the ecumenical councils the, were not created in a vacuum. Basically the pattern of all the ecumenical councils is set for all time in the, what could be described, I guess unofficially, as the Council of Jerusalem, which is described in Acts chapter 15. And the pattern, the, the same paradigm, the same uh, series of events that constitute an ecumenical council began actually with that. And you can read about it in, in the Bible in Acts chapter 15. The ecumenical councils were called not just because it was time to like every four years or every three years or, or whatever. They were always called in response to a theological controversy, a major theological controversy. And uh, so this is that was the case, at the Council of Jerusalem in Acts chapter 15. What was the theological controversy? And certain men came down from, Ju from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. This caused a great uproar within the church and it, it, it called for an ex careful examination as to whether or not this was true. So following the theological controversy, next we have the ga gathering of the apostles and the presbyters, which in those days were called elders, which is what the word uh, presbyter means in Greek. Now the apostles and elders came together to consider this matter. Then they got together and then they debated, they discussed, and this is called conciliarity, which is basically the function of a council. The word conciliar is related to the word council, where they would argue and debate, and then they would come to a decision by consensus. So that happened in the Council of Jerusalem. Therefore, I judge that we should not trouble those from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from things strangled, and from blood. For Moses has had throughout many generations those who preach him in every city, being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. Then it pleased the apostles and elders and the whole church. So this is the church basically in council, the bishops in council deciding this is what the rapidly uh, developing church becoming more and more Gentile every day with, uh, with the conversion of so many Gentiles to Christianity. This is what they were directed to do, the new, newly converted Gentiles. And nothing in here was called to, uh, to respond to a challenge that basically some uh, people were saying that if you were a Gentile, you had to become, you, you had to become circumcised before you could be saved. And there's nothing of this belief from the council. So basically this was a quiet way to say that, that that's not necessary. If you do these things, continue in the faith that we, which you have already been baptized and, and you, you were on the correct path. And so that was the, the conciliarity, the decision by consensus. And then in this council of Nicaea, the, it was not kept in the room, but this, this decision was not just an agreement, but it was actually imposed upon the entire church. We read, to send chosen men of their own company to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, namely Judas, who is also named Barsabas, and Silas, leading men am among the brethren. They wrote this letter by them, and then that letter went on to detail what the decision of the Council of Jerusalem was. And here's some, a little detail that should not go, uh, should not be missed. It says in this, it says, uh, the council said of itself, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And then as they began their, their letter to all the Christians in the world, what their guidance was, what their, what their decision was, on this particular matter. And so you can see that they definitely believed that the Holy Spirit had guided their decision. If you were to ask them, and I'm, they would say, no, this was not our decision. We were sim simply obeying the Holy Spirit which, who was present with us and guided the decisions that we made. So this is one of the reasons that the Orthodox Church to this day 
when there is a true ecumenical council, and there've only been seven, but wherever there is or ever will be an ecumenical council from that, we understand that that is the arena in which the, the will of, the, of God, the will of the Holy Spirit is revealed to the church. And this conciliar decision of the first council of Jerusalem uh, is binding upon all. It goes on to say that the council wished uh, not to lay upon you no greater burden than these necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. And so that was basically a gentle commandment from the council to, to everyone. This was not negotiable. There was, this was not put to a vote of any individual church or any individual bishop, but it was the church acting in council under the leadership of the Holy Spirit with a gathering of, of all the available bishops to make this decision. So you see in this passage of Acts, this paradigm, this procedure for ecumenical councils, all the ecumenical councils follow this biblical pattern established by the apostles. Orthodoxy believes the seven ecumenical councils are the highest authority of the church on earth. They outrank all bishops and all patriarchs. So, the first ecumenical council, official ecumenical council, took place in Nicaea, an area not far from Constantinople in 325. So what was the theological controversy? A priest in Alexandria named Arius was teaching that Christ was not fully divine, but rather a superhuman being. Arius also taught that Christ was created. In fact, there was a, there was a jingle or, or, or motto that the Arians uh, said there was a time when he was not. That was something they said amongst themselves all the time. It was kind of, kind of a, a lingo. Uh, but, but, uh, and that pointed to the fact that they believed that Christ was created. They believed if we could get in a time capsule and go all the way back in time, we would eventually come to the point where there was no Christ and there was no divine Christ uh, because he was born, begotten and born at some point in the past. Now, this doctrine is called Arianism, and just to be very careful to and hasten to add that it is called Arianism only because it was named after the movement of the priest in Alexandria, who was the founder of this belief, it has nothing to do with white supremacy or anything like that. This doctrine was gaining many adherents and was causing an uproar throughout the church. So, following the example of the Council of Jerusalem recorded in the book of Acts, the bishops gathered. 300 bishops gathered in Nicaea in 325 AD to decide the truth or falsehood of Arianism. They came to a decision. What was the decision of the consensus of the council? The bishops heard testimony from both Arius and his opponents and determined that Arianism is a heresy. They declared that Christ is fully God as much so as the Father. He is of one essence, and the Greek word for that is homoousios, and uh, with the Father, and he is eternally begotten of the Father, and he is not, not created. As long as there has been God, there has been the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Christ was not created. He, is, he retains every aspect of God that we understand God to be at all. And then they made their announcement. This conciliar decision of the Council of Nicaea and it was testified to the entire church. The Nicaea, the council wrote the first part of what we know today as the Nicene Creed. They drafted wording which specifically refutes or refuted Arianism. Many of you are very familiar with this. If you've been going to Orthodox churches or uh, maybe also Catholic churches, you will recognize this. And we may not have, not have understood until today why it was worded the way it was. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father before all ages. So this is a refutation, begotten of the Father before all ages. That was put there to refute Arianism, because the Arians believed that the Son of God was begotten 
during one of the past ages, but before the, the council said it was before all ages, that he is light of light and true God of true God. This is something else a Arian could not say. An Arian would say, well, he's not really quite God, but the church through the council of Nicaea says he is true God of true God. And then the council says he was begotten, not created. This is a refutation of Arianism who said that he was created. The next clause of one essence with the father through whom all things were made. So that one essence, that what that, that which the father is, is the same essence of what the son is. And there was the father and the son, and by extension also the Holy Spirit, were the Trinitarian creators of the universe. That's why it says, through whom all things were made. And so this, this whole part of the creed was written specifically by the council to say Arianism is wrong. We refute it, we reject it. Then it continues, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and of the Virgin Mary and became man. And so this was the first part of the, the Nicene Creed, also known in our day as the more completely as the Nice Nicene Constantinople Creed, which we'll get to in a second. And here's the rest of that the creed. And he was crucified for us under Pontius Pilate and suffered and was buried. And he rose on the third day, according to the scriptures, he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the father. And he shall come again with glory to judge the living and the dead. His kingdom shall have no end. And so that at first, this was the end of the creed before, as it was written by the council of Nicaea. The conciliar decision is binding upon all. Again, this was, uh, they, they came to their co conclusion. They wrote a creed to reflect their anti-Aryan position, uh, and the, this was binding to all. This was not put to a vote. This was not voted upon by all the, by individual churches or individual bishops. This was the decision. And once the will of the Holy Spirit had been discerned and the consensus was reached, the council banned Arius and his followers. And this this was the normal way to go. People, the, the bishops that that persisted in rejecting the council and the whole will of the Holy Spirit reflected in that council, they were banned and banished. Then came the second ecumenical council in Constantinople and in the in 381. And I, you see Roman numeral one, just like you see Nicaea Roman numeral one. This is because there will be another, another council of Nicaea and there would be a couple more councils in, in the city of Constantinople. So you will see the, the, the words Nicene, uh, Nicaea and Constantinople again. But this is to the, the Roman numerals to put them in chronological order. So what was the theological com controversy that triggered this ecumenical council in, in the year 381? A new theological dispute broke out regarding the Holy Spirit. Just as the Arians denied the full divinity of Christ, this group similarly, similarly denied the full divinity of the Holy Spirit. They were called fighters against the Holy Spirit. So that was the controversy. It was causing a significant amount of confusion within the church. The church responded. The bishops gathered. 150 bishops gathered in Constantinople in 381 to decide whether the Holy Spirit is fully God along with the Father and the Son. They came to their conclusion decision by the consensus of the council. The bishops declared that the Holy Spirit is fully God along with the Father and the Son and that he pre eternally proceeds from the Father. So this is uh, applying the same theology and logic to the Holy Spirit that the previous council had applied to the person of Jesus Christ, the, the second person of the Holy Trinity incarnate. So the announcement was made, the announcement of the conciliar decision to the whole church. So the council wrote the second and final part of the Nicene Creed, which is what, which completes it, which we still recite today. And in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the creator of life, who proceeds from the Father, who together with the Father in the Son is worshiped and glorified, who, th who spoke through the prophets. So it's that eternal procession of the Holy Spirit from the Father and the fact that the, the 
the Holy Spirit is worshiped and glorified is the council's choice of language to describe that the Holy Spirit is completely God just as much as the Father is just as much as the Son is. And then the, the conclusion of the creed is this, who spoke through the prophets in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, I confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the age to come. Amen. The conciliar decision was binding upon all. 36 bishops were rejected the addition to the creed and were dismissed from the church. These first two ecumenical councils, Nicaea and, uh, and Constantinople, the first of Constantinople, defined the language to describe the Holy Trinity. The next four ecumenical councils defined the language to describe the person of Christ. So what would happen, what was the next one? The next one is in Ephesus. In the, the, the Council of Ephesus, uh, what was the theological controversy? The Patriarch of Constantinople, named Nestorius, taught that the that two natures of Christ, the human and the divine, were not united, but only touching, creating a picture of two Christs existing in one body, to, to almost as if uh, that you have two people living in one body, almost like a split personality. And that's not an exaggeration to what Nestorius was teaching. Nestorius also rejected the popular title of Mary as Theotokos, which is the Greek, Greek for birth giver of God. And he preferred the word Christotokos, the birth giver of only the human Christ, thus splitting Christ into two persons. So at the Council of Ephesus, 250 bishops of the church met in Ephesus, which is in modern Turkey, to render a verdict on these teachings of Nestorius. What was the decision by the consensus of the council? The council rejected Nestorius's doctrine, which presented Christ as consisting of a human person and a divine person in the same body. It proclaimed that Christ rather consisted of two natures united in, into one person two natures, and the Greek word there is feces, and one hypostasis or person. The council also affirmed that the belief that the Virgin Mary gave birth to the full Christ, both of Christ's natures, not just the human nature, therefore she is rightly called Theotokos. Finally, the Ecumenical Council of Ephesus reaffirmed the Nicene Constantinople Constantinopolitan Creed and forbade any future modifications to it. The Fourth Ecumenical Council took place in Chalcedon, also in the same general region of what is today modern, modern Turkey, not far from Constantinople. What was this theological controversy? In spite of the fact that the Council of Ephesus proclaimed that Christ had two natures united into one person, a group began to teach that Christ had only one nature, the divine nature. The human nature was subsumed or absorbed by his divine nature. It's almost as if to put it, what the Monophysites believed is, is to, to use an analogy that Christ's human nature was almost like a cup of water, but his divine nature was the ocean. So what happens when you pour a cup of water into the ocean, the ocean absorbs the the, the, the cup, which is Christ's human nature. That was sort of the way they looked at it. And that's why this group was called the monophysites, which comes from the Greek word that means one nature. So the bishops again gathered. This time it was about 520 bishops and they, they assembled in Chalcedon, which is in modern day Turkey, to assess this doctrine. The decision by the council of the by the consensus of the council, the council of Chalcedon rejected the Monophysite position and reaffirmed that Christ retained both a a divine and a human nature united into one person. The council specified that his human nature was real and was never absorbed by his divine nature, and retaining his existence as the Greek word of theanthropos, which could be described as the God man. That's a pretty good way of describing it. And that's why the, the, this term, this the Greek word and the, and the translation of it 
is what the council used to say he is he was the god man and the man never disappeared into the god the announcement of the conciliar decision to the whole church the council's explanation of the relationship between christ's two natures is a classic on this subject if you ever want to know the most um, effective understandable and complete and trustworthy description of what it is the church believes about the interaction between between christ's humanity and his divinity and why it's so important that both be preserved in his person that was put forth by this this council of chalcedon and i'll read it to you in detail one in the same son perfect in godhead and perfect in humanity truly god and truly human acknowledged in two natures unconfusedly unchangeably indivisibly inseparably the difference between the natures is in no way removed because of the union but rather the peculiar property of each nature is preserved and so that's a very elegant and concise and very understandable description of what the church said why it was essential that christ maintained both natures in his person so the announcement of the conciliar decision was made to the whole church. This Chalcedonian definition was widely accepted, but not by all. Many rejected it. Those that had rejected Chalcedon left the Orthodox Church and formed what are today called the Assyrian Church of the East and a confederation called the Oriental Orthodox Churches. Now that would include, I think we talked about this a couple of weeks ago in our, in our class discussions, discussions. So if you've ever heard of the Coptic church or the Armenian church or the Ethiopian church, they would be part of this group, this broad confederation of churches called the Oriental Orthodox churches that rejects that rejected the definition of Chalcedon and rejected the idea that Christ only had a divine nature, that he had no more uh, human nature. And so this was uh, a tragedy for the church because there have been other, the, the Aryans pretty much disappeared, and some of the other groups, the, 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 the fighters against the Holy Spirit disappeared, but this was the first uh, case where a conciliar de decision uh, led to a, a significant breakaway uh, from the Orthodox Church, which was certainly a tragedy. So the theological controversy of the next ecumenical council a substantial number of individual churchmen continued to reject the councils of Ephesus and Chalcedon. 152 bishops assembled in Constantinople to examine the continuing disputes. The decision by consensus, the council reaffirmed the previous councils. Then Constantinople, this is the third ecumenical council that convened in the city of Constantinople. And this, this group appeared, a group, the theological controversy was, a group appeared to believe, appeared that believed that Christ had only one will, and that was a divine will. He did not have a human will. This group was called the Monothelites, a Greek word which means one will. 151 bishops gathered together to meet, to decide the merits of the Monothelites, and the decision was made by the consensus of the council. The council determined that just as Christ had two natures, human and divine, he also had two wills, human and divine. Although the human will surrendered, surrendered to the divine, it nevertheless did not seek to, it did not cease to exist. So we would call to mind, for example, our Lord in the Garden of Eden, or excuse me, the Garden of Gethsemane, said, Father, it be, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. His humanity, he recoiled about at what was about to happen. But he's nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. So this would be a good example of this. The, the human will, the will of the, the humanity of Christ being distinguished from, but yet obeying the divine will of the Father. And so that was an important, uh, important uh, event in the, in the development of the church and, and our doctrine. Now comes the seventh and final ecumenical council, and this took place in Nicaea, same place as the first one in 787 AD. 
What was the theological controversy which triggered the Seventh Ecumenical Council? A controversy appeared in the church fueled by political superstition, which began to reject Christian images of Christ and the saints called holy icons. The church had incorporated holy icons into public and private worship, worship since its earliest days. According to, to tradition, several icons in the church's possession were painted by the evangelist Luke. Icons were painted in the catacombs during the Roman persecutions, and by this time were found in all the Christian temples of worship. By this time, the religion of Islam had also come in, into being, a very iconoclastic religion, and we'll see it a second time. The, the, uh, the word iconoclast or iconoclastic means destroyer of icons. And that was very true of Islam. Uh, Islam is very, very uh, direct and does not like any depiction of any holy thing. And its followers were conquering <clears throat> large amounts of Christian territory across the Middle East. This was causing great alarm in the Eastern Christian Roman Empire. The emperor, in consultation with some of the bishops, decided that the reason God was allowing his Christian empire to lose to the Muslims was because the church was falling into idolatry through the use of holy images. This was the beginning of the iconoclastic period and was a very difficult time for the church. The emperor and some of the bishops believed that these icons violated the second commandment. It is in the, in, in the 10 commandments, the second commandments uh, of the 10 commandments, which is in Exodus chapter 20 says this, you shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. So this first part of it, you shall not make for yourself a, a carved image. This was the, that was what the emperor at the time and some of the bishops thought that must be why we're losing to the, the Islamic armies. Based on this interpretation, the emperor ordered all icons to be removed from all Christian churches. The only religious symbol permitted to remain was the cross. This pr produced a massive reaction. Most of the faithful removed the icons from their churches and hid them rather than allowing them to be confiscated and destroyed. So that, that triggered was a, uh, because of the outrage and uproar over this, this edict from the emperor, there was another gathering of the bishops, uh, the seventh of the final of our ecumenical councils. The emperor and all those who sided with him were called iconoclasts, a Greek word which means breakers of icons. As a result of this provocation and backlash, 308 bishops converged on the city of Nicaea, the same city where the first ecumenical council had been held over 400 years, 450 years before. They were to decide if icons were idols, and if not, why not? The decision by consensus of the council was this. The council heard various arguments, very, various testimonies from both the pro and the icon camps. The arguments of St. John of Damascus proved decisive in preserving icons in Christian worship. John asserted that before God became human, God could not be depicted. But because of the incarnation, God now had taken upon himself a human body in Christ as a result of the incarnation. That body could be depicted in paint and stone. Each icon, in fact, bears witness to the vital Christian belief that God has become man in the person of Christ. He also explained that we do not worship the paint and the wood, only God, and we offer veneration to the images. In this, he distinguished the use of two terms, worship, latria, which, uh, and veneration, which is proskinesis, which are up until that point were being used interchangeably. So the church made a, made a significant and vital clarification that worship is for God alone. 
that we do not worship the, the images. We honor them, we respect them. I use the analogy of, of when uh, the flag is raised and they sing the national anthem, it's common for Americans to stand and take their hats off and be quiet and, and respectfully uh, listen to the national anthem. We, re re we re uh, render a certain degree of veneration or proskinesis to that event. Or if we go to a courtroom and the judge enters and the bailiff says, please rise, what we, we do that in respect to the position of the, of the judge, what we're doing is a, a form of proskinesis, which is honor or respect or veneration. But those are two entirely different things than worship. So the council agreed with John's arguments to ensure that icons would never be used as idols. The council made a clear distinction between honor or veneration in Greek and, and, would, and would remain appropriate to the use of the icons and worship, which is reserved for God alone. The announcement of this conciliar decision was made to the whole church. When the, uh, when the, church, the council proclaimed its support of icons and ordered that they be restored to the churches, it was received with great joy among the people. This final event happened on the first day, Sunday of the holy season of Lent. So the faithful took their icons out of hiding and brought them back into the churches. Ever since, all Orthodox Christians bring icons from their homes and process with them around the church on the first Sunday of Lent, the Sunday of Orthodoxy, celebrating the, the, the restoration of the holy icons. So now we'll take a, spend a few minutes just talking about the rapid expansion of early Christianity. We basically in the last few classes covered more or less from Pentecost all the way up to uh, beyond the, the fourth century, but to using maps to give you a picture of where Christianity was and where it was present, but not particularly strong and where it was present and, and became a significant uh, portion of the populace. Around 250 AD, you can see the darker the orange, the more common that was a place for Christians. And if, if it's yellow, some green, none at all. But you can see by 406 AD, Christianity had spread widely all across the north shore of Africa. Much of the, the Middle East, what is today would be, for example, Israel, Syria, Lebanon, all of uh, the, the western part of what is today Turkey, Constantinople, Constantinople the western part of Europe, all the way far, as far north as Roman Britain. So it was in this context that the church was growing extremely rapidly through all the events that we have been going through today. So this concludes our class today. Thank you for participating by watching this video. If you have a question or comment, please feel free to send it to this email address. I enjoy hearing from you if I have a question and if, if I can respond to it, I'll be glad to do so. May have a very blessed day.